My name is Jos Capito, and this is Cars and Culture with Jason Stein. It's my absolute pleasure to welcome a Formula One team principal to the show. Joost, welcome into Cars and Culture. Yeah, thank you very much, Jason. It's a pleasure for me to be in your show. Thank you. Thank you. You're, you're just um, coming off results at Baku, and you are headed to Montreal in a very full summer season now. But let's talk about where the year is for you. How has the year gone for you, Joost? Yeah, I think we're not really happy with how the year gone. You know that there are new regulations for Formula One. The cars are all pretty new. And um, so it was really exciting to see where everybody comes out. And we didn't come out where we really wanted. So we're working hard on updates. But, uh, you know, the cost cap regulations make it really hard. You have to be very careful when you bring which updates. Um, as this also has an impact on next year's development and next year's car. So we're planning to have the update for Silverstone and uh, let's see where it gets us. So from the wind tunnel and from the data we have, it looks pretty promising and we hope we can do a step forward with this. What has surprised you the most about, about this year? Uh, it's difficult to say. Um, there was not too many surprises. I think that the, the big teams so could invest a lot in recent years. They come out having the best cars for this year is again, and these are very much the manufacturer cars. I think the midfield got much closer. So we will you have seen more variations in the results. It's not a clear ranking from team one to 10. So you have a couple of, uh, you have about three teams who can who can go for the, for the first, then you have really the midfield. And uh, the midfield to the end of the field is pretty close as well. I think that is uh, what the regulations wanted to achieve that the cars get closer. And I think they achieved that. And um, I think they will still get closer as this is the first year of a new development. So now you learn from the other teams. And I think with that, the cars will even get closer the years to come. And you've talked about that you being fairly aware, you told Motorsport Magazine that you're aware it's a minimum five-year program in order to make the kind of progress that, that you want. So. Here we are, you know, you're in the early stages of all of that. But um, when you, you compared yourself to some extent to say that when teams come back like a Ferrari, it took five years. Um, how much more effort will it take and, and what will need to change in order for you to meet that five year um, uh, time frame and goal? Yeah, it's to say that Williams in recent years, they didn't have the financial means to invest and to move the team forward. And now with the new investors, we have the budgets, we can work according to the cost cap. But last year, the cost cap came in. So we have to catch up with the other teams. But we have, uh, we are, we say limited as the same cost cap as the other teams as well. So to catch up with the same resources, I think it's harder than if you just can, uh, uh, we'll say out invest the other teams what is not possible anymore so we have to really look on the long-term strategy and find smart solutions that we can uh, progress the team faster than than the other teams do and this needs a lot uh, a lot to look into the infrastructure into the tools we have as formula one became with the cost cap formula one became an efficiency competition so who gets the best out of the out of the resources that are allowed has the best car. So and that's where the teams have to focus on. You've taken on such a unique role and replaced obviously Claire Williams as as team principal on on what is a fair a, a very family oriented racing team. How has your experience this time around differed from your your time with Sauber? By it's. I wouldn't say it's that much different because Salva was also a family orientated business in that case, as mm -hmm. Peter Salva, the owner, was the team principal and the CEO. It was very much the same as the early stages in Williams as well. Um, the, the, the challenge at Williams is to keep the, the family atmosphere, but um, move it into, um, let's say, a bigger company culture, as we've got around 500 employees. And uh, you need different communication systems and different processes 
than you had before when it was a family business. And uh, family business isn't bad, but it needs adoption when, when the company grows like this. And that's the process we are in right now. And this Williams history, I mean, it is so rich. I, I, I heard an interview that you had done where you talked about the fact that as a young boy, as a, as a Formula One fan, Williams was everywhere. Williams was everything. It's got to be hugely important to you. It's it, it, an enormous um, um, opportunity to restore that. Yeah, it's an enormous opportunity, but it's also, let's say, a, a big challenge and puts also pressure on you. Yeah, um, I just had retired when I got the call from uh, the new owners from Doyden Capital. If they, if I would be willing to talk to them about the CEO role of Williams Racing, and uh, of course, as you as you mentioned, as a young kid, I spent all my pocket money in sending letters to the Formula One teams in the UK and asked for autographs. And uh, at that time of my life, I would have never imagined ending up being a CEO and running a Formula One team. If that would be for me too much to imagine even. And when you then come at the end of your career, you come, uh, you get this kind of opportunity where with 40 plus year um, experience in motorsport and the automotive industry and uh, thinking that this is the right combination to get Williams back up to speed and take this challenge then I think it uh, was a no-brainer for me to accept this. And I wouldn't have accepted any other uh, challenge in motorsport, I believe. How long did it take you to say yes when the phone call came? I mean, I, as you said, you, you, were, you were retired. Yeah, it was, uh, we had the first meeting and, and uh, with the board of, of Doyleton Capital. I felt immediately that we were on the same wavelengths that the chemistry was right. And um, I got the trust that they didn't want to change the Williams name. They want to keep the name and uh, they believe in the heritage. They are fascinated by the heritage and they're also interested to get the team back on track in the long term. And, uh, and that convinced me then after that first meeting that um, yeah, that is the right thing for me to do as I get the support from the board. And I want to go back to something that you said earlier, being being a fan of, of the Williams team. You went to the Nürburgring with your father in the 1960s, and you walked the paddock with your father and walked up to the cars and into the museum and the Williams name being everywhere. And some might not even know that, I mean, Williams as a, as a whole has had greater long-term success than almost anyone outside of Ferrari. Uh, a boyhood dream come true. Yes, um, <clears throat> I think that's definitely. It doesn't come out of the blue. Yeah, I've been in motorsport all my life. I've been at Sauber as CEO. I've been had the short stint at McLaren as the CEO. So um, when I was at Ford, I was in charge of the Cosmos engine program for the Jordan team. Um, so I've I've been in and out. And at Porsche, I've been in charge of the Super Cup. Uh, establishing that in the in 93 so that was all in formula one so i've been around formula one for yeah for more than 20 years and it was in and out different roles so um it's you know, i would say it's also a logical development but i hadn't expected it to come yeah let's go back to that early history um you went to university in munich and and you were uh, employed at BMW during your diploma work. You always wanted to work on the performance car side, but you also were part of the M3 gas engine development, correct? Take me back to that. What, what do you remember from those early days? I remember a lot from these early days as <clears throat> they were really great days. So I went to Munich because and the university because I wanted, my dream was to work for Paul Roche who was the BMW engine guy behind the Formula One engine, touring car engines, Formula Two engines. And uh, I was fascinated by, by that. And um, that's, I also was racing Sundup um, motorbikes in for Sundup in, in uh, 79. So, and Sundup was based in Munich. So it was a natural choice then to go to Munich as BMW is in Munich. And I also raced for a Munich motorbike brand. And um, 
and then I did, I fought hard to get my diploma work at the BMW M GmbH, okay, BMW M Limited. Um, and I was, uh, my, my work was there uh, to define the gas exchange of the first M3 engine. So the four cylinder, four valve engine. And um, then I thought, okay, if I do a good job, I might get employed during my diploma work. And that actually happened. And then we were a small group. It's just two engineers, me and a colleague. We were in charge of the performance development for the, for the M road engines. And uh, that fascinated, uh, fascinated me a lot. And I still love the first M3. It's one of my favorite cars of all time. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You were, uh, and I just want to emphasize a point here, motor, motocross racing and motor racing as a whole and endurance <laughs> racing really ran through your family's blood. I mean, your father was in the Dakar uh, rally in 1979 and, and actually did it on a, on a motorbike uh, at one stage. Um, uh, just, just a dedication to endurance racing that passed on to you as well, right? Yeah, we went, um, you know, my father was always fascinated of motorcycle racing, especially enduro racing, where he founded the local motorsport club. And then it was clear when 16, I have to race enduro. And that was in 74. And in seven, so yeah, I went motocross and enduro racing from 74 to 81. And uh, my father and my mother, they went on vacation in the Sahara in 79 and met, uh, seen the rally there and met uh, Thierry Sabine, who, who started the rally and invented the rally. And they became friends. So my father did it in 81 with a motorbike, uh, but he didn't finish. So we said, okay, there is unfinished business for the family. We have to do something. And then we raced again from 83 to 86. And um, in 85, I won the truck category with my father and my brother and a friend of us in a second Unimog. They came third. So it was, uh, was the most successful year. And we went back in 86 again, wanted to do it again. And then there was the accident with uh, the helicopter crash where Terry Sabine and, the, and with four people in the helicopter, they, they died in that crash. And that for us was the point that we said for then we get out of the rally because that was because we lost a good friend. And also without him, we felt being unsafe racing in the desert in Africa. So that was the Dakar experience. Is the Dakar experience the hardest event to do in racing? Um, I, I don't know how it is now at that time. I think it was definitely the case because it was 11,000 kilometers in three weeks. And we were just, I would say also depend how you do it. We were four people in two trucks and that was the entire team. So we had to do absolutely everything, uh, just the four of us. And that was definitely very hard. And I believe that was for me vital to get all the experience in racing as you have all jobs that are in racing that you have to do your own. So you look after the food, you have to do the paperwork, the admin, you have to navigate, you have to race, you have to be the engineer, you have to be the mechanic. So that gives you a good feeling of the importance of every single job in racing. And then you can appreciate every single job anybody is doing in the team. And I think that is what it's, it's necessary to create the team spirit that you value every, everybody's job uh, at the same yeah an amazing amazing experience your your father uh ran a transport business right from your hometown in neunkirchen just north of frankfurt no, no he didn't do a transport business so we <laughs> when people say well do you have an automotive background and uh, say, so, yeah, yeah, my family has an automotive background because my grandfather had the company and uh, one thing he did was wheelbarrows. So he say, yeah, I come from the automotive business. They just had one <laughs> wheel and one horsepower. <laughs> and then people don't believe, but that's the history. And then my father created a company where, he, where we did oil burners for house heating and then also sauna ovens and uh, the sun beds but we were not in, in any car related business. Okay. A different kind of transport one wheel. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, let's let's talk about your about your time at Sauber and and how influential that that <laughs> was in your life and 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 maybe how that led to different decisions. How impactful was that? Uh, it that yeah, it, it it turned out different than it originally was planned. So I joined Sauber to build up and to create Sauber Petronas Engineering, the commercial business side for Sauber. So when I say it's not not in racing, but it, it's close. And um, it, the, the challenge was to come up with a master plan for Petronas for the Malaysian automotive industry. What well, was really interesting. So during, during that build up, Sauber did an investigation from an external consultants agency, what the team would have to do to become more competitive in Formula One. And the result was that it has to develop more into an industrial company and from like the, like the family run company to an in industrial process run company. And uh, with my experience at BMW and Porsche before and of what they have seen, how we built up Sauber Petronas engineering, I was asked if I would uh, join the Formula One side in addition to my job on the commercial side as a COO to transform the team into a into into a was engineering company and uh, of course i did that and uh, it worked out pretty well from 98 to 2001 we came from eights to fours in the manufacturers championship and it was the first non manufacturer team so it was hugely successful and uh, and i enjoyed that part of the business you know to really restructure the team and make it competitive and I think that's this. That is a good experience I can use in my job now, even if it's twenty plus years ago. Yeah, sure. You you met a young driver while you were there named Kimi Raikkonen. What did you like about Kimi the first time you saw him? Yeah, it was hard to convince Peter to get to, to invite him. Um, so I met his, his manager, and he said about he has a really good young Finnish talent. And he gave me the name, so I checked it all up at that time where you could do in the internet and looked at the magazines. And I've seen that he won race, kart races in the wet with slicks because he couldn't afford uh, wet tires. So I invited him to Sauber and I think the first meeting looking into his eyes, say, yeah, this guy, this young boy is very special. And he was so dedicated. And then uh, really Ramp and I, we worked hard on Peter to convince him to give him a chance. As then first he said, oh, I would like to have him as a test driver. And it was Kimi was 19. And he said, Mr. Sauber, I'm not a test driver. I'm a race driver. Then I prefer racing Formula Renault instead of being a test driver. So mm -hmm. that was highly impressive for a guy 19 gets the offer to, to get the, to be a test driver in Formula One and declines. <laughs> and I think that that really without if he would have accepted, he would have been a test driver and his career wouldn't have been developed as it did because then finally he got the seat. Wow. And the development that Kimi went through that you watched from a distance, what was that like? Yeah, I think he's, I, I love him as a, as a person. I think he's a fantastic guy. He's, he's got his heart on the right place. And once a journalist told me, say, uh, having one sentence from Kimi is more than having an hour talk from the other drivers. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think he is like, like the Finns and the Scandinavians are, they are spot on. And if he says one sentence, you, there is a lot behind it. So, and, and I think you can think about, yeah, you can interpret a lot what he means with one sentence. And that's, I really like with him and he stayed the person he was always. And, with all the goods and bads he has, but he's, he's a real character and a lovely guy. So let's talk a little bit about the you you leading forward of Europe's rally team and the, the head of Volkswagen Racing and the Volkswagen Cup. What sticks out as a as a as a moment in your career as being very pivotal with <laughs> those groups? How important was it to be part of those groups? I think was was all was all important. Yeah, I I loved all these jobs and loved all the involvement. I think it was in two thousand six with Ford when when we won the manufacturers world championship in in rallying after twenty seven years for Ford. I think that's a that's a very special moment. And um, then of course with Volkswagen 
to win the first rally in the first year in in Mexico was the third rally that was a really special moment as well and then of course winning the first world championship with Volkswagen in 2013 was was exceptional as well so yeah it was all good times and I worked always with very good people and uh, always there were very good teams what is important without the team you would not achieve anything yeah, Joost, what did you learn from those experiences? I mean, it's a, obviously a, a, a completely different style and form of racing <laughs> than, than what you're involved in now. But what did you bring with you? Was it that team aspect? Was it the uh, rallying around all of those um, positions to make the team successful? I think at the end, motorsport is motorsport. And it's always, it's, it's a team sport. Yeah, you know, the Formula One teams are quite are bigger than the than the rally teams, but rally is very different as well. You work much longer times in rallying. The rallies are longer, and the team has to be even more united and aligned than in any other sporting, and especially also then in Formula One. But if you can get this, and I think rallying is also more down to us because you are in the countries, you are with the fans, you are with the with the population in the countries you are not in a dedicated paddock that is completely excluded to public so you get much more contact to fans and uh, i think you learn what fans really want from motorsport and uh, this openness i think is quite good to carry that into formula one as well and uh, it's also less politics but um, i think formula one can also can live good with a bit less politics and that's what i try to achieve when you talk about being in in the place where you are now and and look at your long career and the and the various iterations of it going from from uh, formula 1 to rallying now back to formula 1 it 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 must strike you as being a and just an incredible journey that you've been able to take here that your career has come full circle now being back where you're sitting today is that right yeah, I wouldn't say uh, full circle. I think it moved on. Um, I mm. never had the expectations of what doing next. So I always, my philosophy were, uh, was I have to do a job I really love and enjoy and do it the best possible way. And then other opportunities come up. If you do something that you love, then you do it well. And if you focus on that and don't plan too much ahead what should be next, then the next opportunities come and then opportunities come you would never really aim for. Yeah, I'm sure I would have never ended up in being a Formula One principal if I would have uh, put a career plan in place in the young age because that would have been seen so much out of reach. Yeah, yeah, true, true. Well, there's so much attention now on Formula One, Joost. And of course, much of that has been driven by a Netflix show. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think the, especially the, the hype that Formula One has in the US now is driven by the Netflix show Drive to Survive. Um, we worked very close with the Netflix guys last year as uh, there is one episode from in the series four. It's dedicated to Williams and it's the fight of the team for the first points again. And uh, I, I really like it. I think when, when I look how the episode went out and, and how it is, I think it's very realistic. And it's quite, it shows the public that it's not just about uh, the two, three drivers who fight for the win. You see how dedicated the team is to get its first point again. And you can't see that when you follow the races because you don't know what is behind that. And I think there the show does a fantastic job and see how, how dedicated a team has to fight to come back from tents and uh, get the first points again and how the relief that is for the team and what work is behind to, to change a team, make a team successful again. I think that it's, it's for me, I believe it's very worthwhile to watch. At the beginning, I said, I, I don't want to watch it and this is not real. But then I started looking into it because I had to, and I found it adds a big value to, to Formula One fans and people who want to know a lot about, uh, about Formula One. And I think it's very close to reality. Does it surprise you how open Formula One is now relative to where it was the last time that you were involved? I mean, the previous administration had, had no interest in, in 
uh, opening the velvet ropes or pulling the curtain back. Now, all of a sudden, everything is out there. It's, it's such a difference, right, Ghost? Yeah, it's a huge difference. And, but also the technical opportunities are much better. I think when you look back in Formula One, the TV uh, quality they had and the broadcast they had, that, that was very much ahead of any other sport through the years. But of course, the times have changed. And uh, with an American company coming in and running the sport based on how sport is also run in the US, this is very successful. And now also with the CEO of Stefano Domenicali, who has been in Formula One long time. Uh, yeah, and, and, and he has been in the automotive industry. I think they have found the perfect CEO now to combine the values of Formula One, but also getting out in public and, and show the real nature of the sport and make it much more available for everybody. You've lived in, in Michigan for a time. You have obviously uh, worked in North America for, for a, a long time. Does the appeal of Formula One now in the United States, um, has it finally taken hold? Because there's been yeah, a lot of fits like and starts in the, in the past. Yeah, it looks like. You know, my daughter is, is 24. She studied in Boston. She is now back in, in Europe. And she says she gets calls and emails and messages from her friends who were never interested in any racing. And now she gets nearly daily, she gets messages about Williams, about Formula One. And she said, this is amazing to see uh, for especially young people who have never been interested in racing, now getting interested in Formula One. And you see the demographics in the US, it's a very young demographic being interested in Formula One. And it's also a huge amount of, of female fans uh, now in the US created, I, I believe very much to drive to survive. And when you watch drive to survive and then looks in the, in, watch the races and know the characters a bit more, then it makes the races much more interesting. And uh, I think now we have the, had the first race in Miami. Yeah, it was, it was outstanding for the first time was really fantastic. Next year, it's uh, Las Vegas will be added. And we have Austin and we have Montreal and Mexico. So there are five races within US, Canada and Mexico. And uh, I think there is more interest in, in cities to have a Formula One race as they see what business it brings for one week into the cities to have a Formula One race. What an amazing accomplishment for a sport that w had global appeal for a long time, but really had a hard time getting going here. I was at the first Detroit race back in the early 1980s. And while there was initial appeal, the problems with the track and, and, and other, other driver related issues, it kind, of, it kind of withered away. And Indianapolis had the same thing. Uh, they, they attempted it and it, again, it failed. But, but now, as you say, it's taken hold. Yeah, and no, I believe it's it's based on drive to survive. Drive to survive made it made it public what Formula One is, and then the the interest in the races uh, started as well. And we look at Miami; that was was a big event. It was a party for the whole week, and <clears throat> and it's still uh, serious racing involved. And I think this combination is very attractive. To, to people and also to young people, what it was not really before. Yeah. Uh, young drivers who are successful and charismatic help too. And I want to talk about a driver who you had in your stable briefly, but uh, George Russell, did he remind you of Kimi Raikkonen? Mm. <laughs> it, it's very different. It's very different characters. I, think, I mean, from uh, a talent, from a talent perspective. From a talent point, yes, for sure. But they, it's also different generations. What the young driver had to bring in the late 90s or early 2000s to now is, is, is very different. Also, the sport has become so much more professional for the drivers. I think in the way Kimi came in in, in 2000 or 2001 would not work really now anymore. And, uh, but the dedication is very much the same that I see in both. They both believed so much in themselves that they will be they will get to the top of formula one and that they have the capability i think that it's the highest commonality though they have they 100 percent believe in them and the demands that someone like george places on himself are 
are fairly monumental. Tell me a little bit about George as a person. Yeah, George is, George is a fantastic, uh, fantastic young guy. Um, I think every, every lady would wish him to be the, the son-in-law. <laughs> so <laughs> the, he's, he's such a lovely guy. He's dedicated. He's very focused and um, he is very team orientated as well. Um, and with, with all the talent he has, I believe he has a big future and he never lost his, uh, you know, lost to have the feet on the ground. And uh, I see that even now being so successful, he is holding back and he is delivering and he's doing his job. Uh, he's, just, he's just a really nice young man. There are so many great young men who are racing now. Um, you, when, you, when you look at the field for Formula One, you, you must have a lot of um, uh, hope and, uh, and, and, and positive vibes about where this sport is going, I'm sure. This, this new young crop of drivers that are out there. Yeah, and these young drivers are very charismatic. I think that it's, you have to go quite a while back that you had a couple of drivers in around the same age and being this charismatic. Yeah, if you go from Max, if the Leclerc, if Lando, if if Alex, if George, and uh, and now also young drivers coming up, this is absolutely fantastic to see. And they are all different characters. They are different people. They have different lifestyles, and I think that it's also attracting a lot of fans to the sport. And they are outgoing. Yeah, they are on social media. They communicate. They they tell their view. And um, there was a time I think when drivers were very much driven by the corporate uh, messaging and PR of manufacturers. And I believe these young guys are not up to that anymore. And they just, they, they keep themselves, they stay themselves and they can communicate their, um, their opinions. And um, I think that, I think that's a, a, that's a basis for Formula One to be successful in the future. And, and you guys coming up again with the same attitudes. And so far from where it was in the past, it's such a very different approach to the sport, right? Yeah, it, of course, every sport got more professional. Yeah, and uh, now we have also many races. We have 22 races planned with 23 races um, and then goes up to 24 races most likely next year. So it becomes more global and becomes more prominent in the households. So, and the fans can follow the whole year. There are not these breaks and gaps in between anymore. It makes it very difficult for the teams to have triple headers. Uh, three weeks in a row a race is very hard for Formula One uh, with all the transportation and all the build up. Uh, it's very hard for the teams and the teams still struggle to adapt to this. But uh, I think for, for the sports itself, it's absolutely a must to have this amount of races and the teams have still more, have to learn more to cope with it. Yeah, give our audience a little bit of a view into, into what teams have to deal with. You mentioned uh, triple headers and an, an intensive uh, June, July schedule. You, you, you stayed in England for the Baku race primarily because you have so many other races and events that will follow. Tell Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, I try to go to most to most of the races, and so far I've been to any uh, but Baku. But uh, you know, when during the race weekend there are 30, 40 engineers working also in the factory, so it's nearly as big as the team itself at the track. And we just introduced our our new ops uh, room. Where, the, where all the engineers can sit, look at the big screen, have their own screens. And uh, we just established that this weekend. So it was good to be with that part of the team for one race as well. And now, you know, it will, will become, it was busy, but now it will become busy as well with, uh, with Canada. And then the week after is the Festival of Speed in Goodwood. It's, uh, it's a fantastic event. We will run most likely two of our heritage cars that will be very interesting. And then the week after is the Silverstone Grand Prix. That's our home race. It will be very busy the whole week. And then the week after is the Austrian Grand Prix. So it's uh, it's extremely busy time of the year. And But the whole year is very busy because it goes until the end of November and then the new car build. And uh, then in February, March, it starts again. 
we focus a lot on culture on this show. And you just mentioned Goodwood and the Festival of Speed. That's about the cultural equivalent of a bullseye in the automotive world, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. Uh, and um, every year, every year is great. It's, it's so relaxed. All the race drivers, they come from all over the world. They walk around, they are approachable. You can chat with everybody. That makes it so very special. And this year, you know, my, my, my uh, teen's hero, uh, Giacomo Agostini, he will be there and celebrate his 80th birthday with all his mates he raced against at that time, driving up the hill. So I'm very much looking forward to this as well. Wow, wonderful. Let's talk a little bit briefly here about your two drivers who you have um, and the talent that, that, that Williams has behind the wheel of, a, of its Formula One cars. And um, Alex and uh, Nicholas, uh, what, what are their qualities? Well, I would say if we start with Nicholas, he has been in the team. He's now the third year in the team. He is a very good team player. He can bring the team together. Uh, he is also very much down to earth. Um, he has certain, his speciality is, yeah, he's very fast in very fast sequences of the track. There where he's extremely good. Uh, he's struggling this year with a new generation of cars as they are very difficult to drive exactly in these fast sequences where he normally has his strengths. So for him is a double struggle and uh, we work hard with him that he gets more acquainted, more comfortable with the car. So if you have the confidence in the car, you can go quick. If you lose the confidence in the car, especially in, in driving situations where you have, we normally are extremely comfortable, then it's quite a big hit. So we are working hard with him and we believe that, uh, that the upgrade we get with the car for Silverstone will help him. And, and Alex, uh, and Alex um, I think Alex is, came in with quite experience. Um, yeah, he has been in Alpha Tauri. He has been at Red Bull. And also what I underestimated, the experience and the know-how know he got being last year out of the car, but being at most of the Grand Prix and seeing the culture in the team and seeing the interaction and see what the driver's impact can be in the team on different ways, how he interacts with the team. I think that he learns a lot and is now very experienced in that and uses this knowledge to his very best, that he brings all his experience in. But uh, uh, he is he's a very smart guy as well. He is very good in communication. And he works also well with, with Nikki. And uh, I think that's also important for, for Williams right now in the situation where the team is that we are not at the top, that we have two drivers who combined work in the benefit of the team and not fighting each other. So they complement each other and they have been teammates in Formula 2 in 2018. And they, they respect each other highly from there and became really friends and this is highly beneficial for the team right now. Is, uh, also, they have very much the same driving style. So that means we don't have to go in two directions with the development of the car. Yeah. Joost, what will success look like for you by the end of the year, by the time that we, we reach the final race? Yeah, it was difficult for us to define, say, before the season, what uh, success was looked like. Um, and say our, our objective is... But, you know, with the new regulations, nobody, nobody knew in what would be the, the hacking order. And uh, what our objective is that we are in a better position regarding the speed of the car on track than we were beginning of the season. So as beginning of the season, we were last. So uh, success is being what would be being eight in the ranking of the speed of the car not necessarily the championship standing because this is based on points but in our analysis how fast the cars are that we want to be eights there and as we go into next year now having some exposure to the you know the new technology and the new car how will you define how well you do in 23 um uh, you know, we, we talk about success by the end of 22, but if we get to the end of 23 or 24, I'm looking at your five-year plan, your, your minimum five-year program, as you said, where would you want to be at that point? 
it's again for the year for next year to to climb up uh, accordingly to the ranking and the higher the higher you get the the smaller the steps will be yeah we um, we have to catch up a lot and this is why we don't have a proper you know we have a five year plan but it doesn't lead us that we say we want to win the championship or races in five years it shows the progress we are going to do and we have to adjust our plans accordingly year by year and say if our progress is good enough or if we have to readjust the plan to to get in the position finally to win races and win championships again but we don't put a year or a timing to this we we put the timing on making progress yeah fair enough you're also doing a you're you're doing a wholesale transition of the team itself while keeping that that same williams family culture what is it like to find quality employees this day, these days in Formula One? Is is it hard to find the 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 sort of people that that you're looking for? Yeah, I think for the whole industry, it's it's hard to find uh, to find the people we are looking for. It's um, it, it's very hard work, and we have to adapt to the say to the way of work that young people want to work. It's different than it was in the past. And there, I believe the whole industry has to adapt and has to change as well to offer uh, work spaces, workplaces that are different than they have been in the past, as the expectation of the young generation is extremely different as well. And uh, of course, it's very important to look after the after after the employees. Uh, I think the physical health, mental health is much more important than than it has been in the past. And uh, the team spirit and the culture is extremely important. And uh, if you're a race team, you win and you lose together. And if you have the whole team that we want to win together, then that's the basis that we can move forward. And uh, that means also a lot of communication that uh, everybody wants to know what's going on, how we improve and what will happen next. So we spend quite a lot of time of communicate, communicating with the entire team and uh, really bond the team together well and everybody works together on the on the monaco broadcast yost the tv commentators pulled you aside because they were surprised to see a team principal pushing a tire trolley that carried race tires along the paddock and you said to them yeah why not it needs to be done <laughs> everybody pulls their own weight right yeah, exactly. I was surprised that uh, that was even taken taken attention. Yeah, as I see that the guys were struggling to get these trolleys out of uh, out of the grid into the paddock again. Then and me saying that, of course, I go there and help them pushing. It's um, I think that that's a base of teamwork. If you see somebody is struggling and needs help, you help whatever it is. And I have no problem get my hands dirty. <laughs> Well, you are getting your hands dirty and you are uh, with a team with a historic level of uh, championships in the past. And, and for those who don't understand Williams history, nine championships, you know, a lot of talk of Mercedes, but they only have eight and you have twice as many championships as Red Bull. So uh, let, let's let's just remember where Williams racing is in the in the context of Formula One. And we wish you nothing but the best of luck, Joost. So thank you very much. And I have to thank all the fans in the US. We've got a huge number of fans in the US and it's getting more and more. And we, we also do a lot for our fans in the US and much more to come. I really appreciate the support we get from our US audience. And as me having lived in, in Michigan, I loved living there. I love Michigan. Uh, and I'm, I'm so happy to see how the sport is developing in the US as uh, yeah, I really love the U.S. and yeah, and thank thank you everybody so much for the huge support. We'll consider you a Michigander to some extent, absolutely. Yeah, thank you very much.